Hello, everyone. So this is a session on drafting MAC clauses, but MAC clauses today, because today is uh, very relevant today, as in how they apply in today's context. And the context will keep changing. And if we have the session next year, that the context may be very different. Um, we have three uh, participants, three uh, panelists, or three people who will run the session today. I'm suggesting a partner with Jay Sagar Associates. Um, with me is Siddharth Sethi and Pulkit Sukramani, both partners as well with JSA. Um, and uh, hopefully, at the end of the day, uh, we will have, uh, we, we hope to give you some understanding of not just what MAC clauses are, their history, their construct, but also some tips on how to draft and how to approach them going forward. The presentation will be structured in the following manner. We will have three distinct, three distinct parts to the presentation, not in sequence. We'll go back and forth amongst them. But there will be the whole, the concept, the theory, the drafting, the practice, the contracts, the writing, the clauses, all of that, which will be spoken about. Um, there will be the section where we will talk about how courts uh, interpret uh, MAC clauses, the hurdles in interpretation. Uh, this really comes from the fact that there is very little case law to guide us on what a MAC clauses are. And I still haven't given you the definition. I haven't told you what this, what MAC stands for, not McDonald's. Um, so that's uh, from the limited case law that we have uh, globally and in India, we'll try and interpret some concepts. Um, uh, we will also clarify the whole issue of whether force majeure and MAC have anything in common, nothing in common, they are the same, or they are, you know, maybe cousins. Um, then we also will spend some time on statute law statutes that may have a reference to one of the important acronyms of MAC, the M, the materiality uh, concept where how uh, sta uh, statute law in India has captured that and certain other concepts captured in, uh, in various statutes in India. So, that's where we come to what is a MAC clause. A MAC clause um, is a material adverse change clause. So MAC stands for uh, material adverse change, um, which is uh, um, a change that happens in a circumstance where the parties find themselves. Also referred to in a material adverse event. Um, so MAE could also be used. I will use MAE as well at some point as the three of us will use. Uh, these are interchangeable acronyms um, and drafters may use one or the other as they decide. It gives the parties an exit um, from the relationship that they have entered into, it gives the parties a way out of um, uh, the deal. Um, and there, there are uses and functionalities we'll come to in a bit, but uh, just to give you a historic context, MAC clauses started uh, very early in the last century, very early when uh, in the US when there was a concept of a merger agreement and a merger agreement was when two parties agreed to merge, they had to wait for certain approvals, certain regulatory approvals and certain meeting certain other conditions precedent before they could consummate or close the transaction. So this period from signing to closing was called the executory period and many things could happen in this period. Obviously the buyer was coming to the deal thinking there's a value in the company. And if those circumstances change the value of the company, then you know they were acquiring something which was less of less value and they were stuck because of the deal, because of the contract they had signed. So it was important for um, this clause to have actually, um, you know, it, you know it, it found its way into merger agreements. And since then it has been used 
in different types of agreements, in loan agreements, in financing agreements, in uh, asset purchase contracts, underwriting agreements, derivative contracts, private equity, secondary market transaction, project financing agreements, and several other documents, including real estate transactions. Um, so what the, uh, the, the, the uh, as uh, when it started, uh, of course, merger agreements were heavily negotiated because, you know, there was a lot of value that uh, was uh, exchanged as a part of the document, as a part of the merger. It's, you know, almost once in a lifetime thing that happened like a marriage between two companies. So a, a lot of time and effort was spent. However, the MAC clauses were not really negotiated too much. They were just sort of drafted and some language was put in. All of this changed um, with the happening of, um, I would say, uh, significant events. So the first event that changed the whole negotiation of MAC was the dot-com burst. When that happened, um, and the whole Y2K and all of that, that was that shook the world, and that's when people realized that things can happen which are outside the control of the parties that can affect the transaction. It's not necessary that you are looking at um, the, a risk that is ascribable to one of the parties or, or to the seller mostly, uh, but to one of the parties. And then came the um, uh, the, the the whole 9/11 uh, terror attack, uh, which was followed by the frauds of Enron and WorldCom, the U.S. Uh, housing bubble, then the recession that came after that, and finally the most recent example, COVID-19. Each one of them has reflected a change in the drafting of a MAC clause. Um, the Drafting um, language has changed, which we will talk about. The exceptions have changed, uh, which is exceptions to the MAC. And then the limitations to the exceptions have also changed. Based on who is more, who has more leverage in a situation, that particular entity, be it the seller or the buyer, that particular entity can determine the structure of a MAC. And you will find those changes happen as time goes by. So that's how the world or the US really drafted these clauses. India, on the other hand, wasn't really following or didn't really have a concept of MAC or wasn't drafting MAC into its contracts because it was primarily relying on common law where uh, the basic concept is that once you sign the agreement, you know, the, the buyer, uh, the, the, the risk passes from the seller to the buyer and then the buyers has to close the deal irrespective of what happens. But over a period of time, as we got more Americanized, our transactions got more Americanized, we had more American companies come to India, there was, uh, the markets were volatile, and the valuations and the risk attached to transactions grew. India started adopting MAC clauses in its documentation as well, M&A documentation is the primary one, and lending and financing documentation. So today it is important for all of us uh, who have joined and for us in general, and you know we are all here to learn as well, not so much to instruct, to understand the purpose, content, form of MAC clauses and see how they apply and um, try and um, figure out how best to draft uh, a clause, uh, a MAC clause, um, based on uh, hopefully your understanding today. And of, of course, we want it to be interactive. So if you do have a comment, please do put your comment in the uh, conversation box, in the chat box, and we will try and address that or include that in our conversation. So, um, the MAC clause really allocates risk. The risk which typically, uh, maybe in common law, moved to, after signing, moved from the seller to the buyer. Once the MAC gets inserted, 
saying that the on the happening of something like the value of the business decreasing, and we'll come to each one in a minute, um, the party gets an exit, which is the buyer gets an exit and can walk away from the transaction. So the risk then moves away from the uh, seller to the buyer in many ways. Um, the um, the uh, MAC can, is used obviously at two levels. It's used as a rep and warranty. Again, we'll elaborate later, but I'll just mention the MAC is used as a rep and warranty where it says that it provides a threshold. So it says, this is the threshold for the for the rep or warranty, um, you know, in terms of disclosure schedules and in terms of actually it being triggered, that the impact has to be over a certain level. So that materiality threshold comes by inserting a MAC in a rep and warranty, or it could be a closing condition where you say no MAC has happened, and that allows the parties to continue with the deal. Um, so it is, um, to give you an example, uh, something like um, between the closing, uh, between the signing and closing, if key people of the company, key managers, key you know, scientists, software engineers walk away, leave the business, um, that could be potentially a MAC because, you know, they take away with them uh, a lot of the knowledge and the company uh, will suffer. Uh, this will be even more relevant if you can't replace those people quickly and adequately. So anything that affects the profitability of the business uh, may form a MAC. The MAC um, could be as a part of the assets and liabilities, uh, could be a part of the IP, the licenses and the leases, the operations of the company. Um, you know, what if it loses a contract that diminishes the future profitability of the business, or it could be market access uh, for the company. So all of these situations could result in a man. Now, we have made it very granular our slides are very granular many of them are very granular some that we're going to have a conversation but please remember these because when we give you the exercise to conduct you will actually have to apply all that you learned over there so how does it really come about so a typical mac definition could say something like a material adverse effect it, when used in the connection of the company, so just be careful. It could be used in any which way. Uh, generally, we use it always in the first, the A, but I've also got you a B. Uh, when it is used in the context of a, of a company or a subsidiary, oftentimes the target, when um, is any change or effect? So the MAC and the MAE are covered by using the word change and effect or any development that insofar as can reasonably be foreseen. Now, um, we will talk about uh, the doctrine of uh, frustration, the common law uh, concept of frustration. And the many things that parties can't foresee and common law really says that if you could have foreseen it, you should have provided for it in the contract or then uh, a default rule will apply. But, um, in terms of drafting, we, depending on the circumstance, we could be forward looking or not. So can reasonably be foreseen is likely to result in a change or effect that individually or in aggregate with such other changes and effects is materially adverse to the condition of the business assets, liabilities, results of operations or prospects of the business of the company and its subsidiaries taken as a whole. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you in quick drafting terms, though we'll come to these in a minute or later, the uh, subsidiary, the, the target often um, tries to, the, the target often tries to say that the business should be considered as a whole. So taken as a whole, it comes from the target. The breakup of business assets, liabilities, results of operations or prospects really comes from the buyer. 
because he can then, if there's a trigger on one of these, he gets a Mac. So it's not on the whole business. It could just be on the assets and he gets a Mac. So I'm just giving you these nuances as you go, as you start drafting. Um, of, of course, when used in the connection of a shareholder, it's everything of that, but it just impacts the ability of the shareholder to do uh, business with the company and uh, with the target. And that is what uh, is a Mac in the context of a, uh, uh, a shareholder or, or one of the parties. Um, another definition could really mean an adverse um, effect um, that affects the financial conditions operations. Um, but here I wanted to highlight some of the um, uh, exceptions that um, uh, get listed. So these are some of the exceptions uh, that uh, you list that that we have, that have been listed from A to E. These are circumstances that are beyond the control of the parties. However, the very interesting uh, sub clause is F which we will be talking about later as well, but I want you to make a note. So what has happened is that the seller uh, did not want anything, just had a sale agreement. The buyer put in the MAC, the seller then inserted A to E, which were all the exceptions to the MAC. And then the buyer came back and inserted F, which said, which is the interesting clause that if any of these exceptions, which are beyond your control, I totally understand you can't control them, but if they happen, however, if you are disproportionately affected by these, so you are not keeping up with your peers, you are just an outlier, then you will, then I can still walk away. Again, this exception, this limitation also come, it comes in two situations, one, where the company or the business is affected differently compared to peers or the industry in which the business is, is affected differently from a global economic change. Um, so to recap, what does um, a, a MAC do? A MAC allows you to exit, allows the uh, buyer to exit or which we'll talk about more, renegotiate the deal. Um, it determines the scope of disclosure or compliance. Remember, I told you it is a part of the reps and warranties. So anything above a certain level, which could result in a material uh, adverse change, um, needs to be disclosed. Uh, or if not, uh, it, it doesn't have to be disclosed. So it determines what will be in the disclosure schedule. And also compliances. During the executory period, people are concerned about small changes they don't worry about because it won't result in a MAC. Like, for example, you know, compliance with cybersecurity laws, a little bit of a phishing attack, they may not disclose or they may not be so bothered about it rather than a ransomware attack. And so it just sets uh, parameters where you can exit, the buyer can exit without liability. Uh, I won't talk about the object, uh, object and subjective drafting, because that's something that will be covered by Siddharth in the uh, force majeure clause. But it is important to note that how detailed you go into the clause uh, and how much you leave, leave it open is also a drafting trick. Um, some quick theories, because we do need to talk about theories, why MAC clauses. One is, of course, the symmetry theory. It just the common law concept. Once you sign the deal, you have to go ahead with the deal really is unfair to the buyer. So it, it sort of it's a contractual readjustment of a asymmetric risk. And the second is an investment theory. Once you've signed the deal, why would the uh, target invest any money in the business? Why does it have to keep it up? Uh, you know, why does it care? Uh, but when you have a Mac, then you do care. So. What are the wish lists, lists that people have uh, in terms of uh, doing, uh, you know, drafting a MAC? The buyer would just like to put the MAC in. 
and would just like to leave them as is. So many ways to exit without having an issue. Um, the seller, of course, would like to limit these. And then, of course, the buyer puts, uh, so the seller puts exceptions to the MAC events. And then the buyer goes ahead and limits each one of those exceptions with uh, an exceptional impact on the seller compared to, uh, to other uh, to its other peers. Now, remember, the more detailed you get and the more the seller or target insists on exceptions, the less the buyer is going to pay and the less problematic the, the deal uh, probably will not go through. We'll come to the ambiguity in a bit, but it is very important to remember that if you are going to make it make the exceptions very extensive, the buyer will probably walk away from the deal. With that, I think it's time that we understand the concept of force majeure and how close or different it is from a MAC, because that is something that we are used to in standard clause drafting. So over to Siddharth. Thank you very much, Sajay, and a very good evening to everyone who's joined us this evening. Very warm welcome to all of you. Now, as my colleague Sajay mentioned at the outset, it is very important for practitioners to understand the purpose, content, and form of a MAC clause and how possibly Indian courts may interpret them. And this is more so since the scope and legal effect of the MAC clause remains largely unknown and difficult to predict. It has to be interpreted, keeping in mind the Indian Contract Act and the concepts that we have, namely of force major and frustration. So the idea here is to see how it is related to these concepts or it is not related at all, or are there any overlaps? Now to start with, I must mention that the MAC concept is slightly different from the force major concept. Well, they both deal with events that trigger the parties to no longer be in a position to carry out the transaction. However, the most notable difference between the two is that while the MAC clauses are relatively vague and do not specify the triggering event for enforcing the same, the force major clause specifies certain circumstances that will excuse performance of the contract. This, in fact, in a lot of ways, makes the interpretation of a force major clause much easier. The other main distinction between a force major clause and a MAC clause lies within the scope. A force major clause is situated at the level of performance of an agreement generally in force and after closing. On the other hand, the MAC clause usually pertains prior to closing of the transaction. And as Sajay explained, from the time of signing to closing. And well, there is a third equally important difference also between these two in terms of the consequences that they entail. For example, one may result in renegotiation of the terms and conditions of the agreement, which in many cases happens with MAC clauses and both Sajay I and Pulkit will throw more light on these in the course of the presentation. Force measure many a time results in termination of the agreement. You would have all heard of the impracticability doctrine. When we speak of the force major clause, it is the standard clause analog of the impracticability doctrine and which provides that a party to a contract is excused from discharging its obligations under the contract as it is practically impossible. Here you need to note that a MAC clause on the other hand does not make the performance impossible. And therefore, the MAC clause is likely based on the contractual doctrine of frustration of purpose. It may not be impossible but the purpose gets frustrated. And what does that mean? 
it means that a contracting party is excused from performing when the expected value of the other party's counter performance has been rendered totally worthless due to some unexpected and extraordinary event. Now, frustration is also a close relative of the impracticable, uh, impracticability doctrine. However, while the clause analog of impracticability doctrine, which is the force major clause, has become standard, the clause analog of frustration has remained largely unknown and untheorized. And even though we say that MAC clause is likely based on the doctrine of frustration of purpose, it is meant to modify and not necessarily restate the elements of frustration. So it modifies the elements, not modifies, not restates the elements of frustration by several aspects. Number one, by permitting excuse on the basis of a significant but not less than total loss in contractual value. Excusing the buyer based on frustration of a secondary as opposed to its primary purpose. And shifting major exogenous risk, that is, those beyond the control of either party, such as an economic recession or a natural disaster, from the target to the buyer. Now, when we say that a MAC clause is more closely linked to frustration of purpose. And when we've looked at case law dealing with frustration, a party, when it is before a court of law, has to establish various elements to bring home the point of frustration. And those are the aspects which will have to be borne in mind even when one is seeking enforcement of a MAC clause. The first aspect is, what was the principal purpose in making the contract? It is important to show what was the specific object without which the party would not have entered into the contract. So principal purpose is important. It is important to show that such purpose has been totally frustrated or nearly so. And I may add here that mere unprofitability or significant losses may not be sufficient. Thirdly, the event which has caused this frustration of purpose must be extraordinary. And you could see from the sample clauses that we had presented on the screen that this expression extraordinary finds mention every now and then. Now this event could be foreseeable and also unforeseeable. And lastly, the event must be an exogenous event that is not in the control of the seller or maybe for that purpose, the buyer also. What is important is that when we try to put this MAC concept in one of the pigeon holes, and the purpose of the presentation today is that traditional interpretation of MAC clauses is largely unpredictable. And we'll discuss in further slides, later slides, that courts are reluctant to interfere or permit a contract to be broken based only on a MAC provision. So one just cannot assume that MAC is a substitute for a carefully drafted, specifically tailored representation and warranty or a closing condition which addresses specific risks and contingencies of the acquired business that have been identified by the buyer. I will throw some more light on the interpretation of MAC clauses a little later. Sajay, over to you. Great, thanks, uh, Siddharth. So, um, coming back, um, I just add to what Siddharth uh, mentioned. How would you determine in a contract? And this is a question to everyone: What the purpose of the contract was, or what the purpose of the buyer was? Where would you determine the purpose? Because he mentioned that the purpose, and again, the purpose could be primary or secondary. Where? in the contract that does this get determined? Let's see if someone comes up with an answer, Pulkit, if you can just check if someone gives us an answer. Where in a contract would the purpose of the buyer be stated? So <clears throat> while somebody is answering that, I'll move on to the drafting of the MAC clauses. Um, the MAC clauses are drafted um, reflecting the current circumstances and the shifts 
uh, in the economic, geopolitical, and societal forces, as I mentioned. The exclusions really cover general and business risk, um, and the, uh, the economic unviability. Um, the issues uh, which have resulted in MAC drafting changing have uh, been listed here, security and stability issues. So did anyone come up with where? No. So it is in the whereas clause, in the recitals. The recitals which we consider completely unimportant is the place where the buyer of a business or the uh, lendee or the person who's taking a loan states why they are doing what they are doing, or it could be the lender who states that, sorry, uh, why they are giving the loan to the company. Um, it is important to be very clear in the whereas or the recital clauses because you will need to use them or they will be read with the MAC clause. Um, some um, concepts we mentioned, there is universal acceptance of MAC clauses. Um, the variations, the MAC clause would vary depending on where you are drafting it. US contracts are very different from UK and Indian contracts. Indian contracts may use a template from one of the overseas jurisdictions. Um, now, how objective you are um, is, is up to you. It can't end up becoming a force majeure clause, so you'll, you'll probably have to have some subjectivity. The subjectivity really comes from the concept of would reasonably be expected to. Uh, which is coming in, which is creeping in all MAC definitions. Um, how forward looking you are, whether an impact that happens today can be predicted as being a MAC for the future, and therefore it is an event in the future, but a change today. Um, it, it's up to you to figure that out. Many events may be very uh, uh, focused on what happens today, but for example, losing a contract with a customer, which is with a key customer, potentially is um, uh, is a forward-looking event that would lose uh, business for the company. Um, the disproportionate effect is something that has also uh, we mentioned it before. Just reiterating that it has become common in today's context. Um, so we'll. Now move on to some samples. First, let's talk about MA and MAC clauses in MA. As I'd mentioned earlier, it could be a CP, a condition precedent. It MAC could have been used as a condition precedent, which says from the date of the last financial statements, no MAC has happened, or from the signing, no MAC has happened. There's really a date which is prescribed. Uh, could be the date of signing, could be the date of accounts, whatever, to the completion or to a particular date that no MAC has occurred. Um, material, again, um, very debatable what it means. Adverse, obviously it means something not in favor. Uh, condition, so that's what we are talking about. A MAC has not happened, is stated in the CP. Um, a warranty, it... Uh, is, is really, and it's, it's reiterated at the end uh, when you close to say everything is true and no MAC has happened, allows parties to walk away from a transaction should a MAC have happened. So it could be used as a CP or a warranty, um, which, uh, you know, could theoretically be considered more a condition subsequent in, in, in a particular context. Um, in financing documents, MAC really um, talk about, you know, it, it could be um, uh, a MAC that happens on the business, which affects the possibility or ability of the business to repay a debt. Um, it could be a repo warranty, which gets reiterated every time there's a drawdown. Um, MAC is also used as a threshold to determine, um, you know, breaches of reps, warranties, and covenants. 
Um, now let's just talk about uh, MAC uh, clause uh, sample. Um, this is a sample for a loan. Um, and in this particular sample, you will look, you will see that um, there has been no MAC which affects the ability of a company to uh, satisfy its obligations. Um, there's been no effect on the value of the secured property or the rights of the financer under a transaction document. So that's typically how a MAC is defined in a financing agreement. As a condition precedent, it's reiterated at every drawdown that the uh, facility agent is satisfied about the viability of the project. So that's typically how it's used in loan documentation. Uh, now let's come to the very important concept of MAC exceptions. We have already uh, explained or spoken about the um, MAC exceptions um, earlier. Here, these are some exceptions or carve-outs that exist um, in typically uh, in, in most uh, M&A transactions. So changes that happen due to acts of war or hostilities, um, changes due to acts of terrorism in country or abroad. Obviously, you all know when this started, uh, this clause started coming about after 9-11. Changes in political conditions, uh, acts of God. Uh, acts of God, you will find uh, a, a, both a frustration and improbability concept uh, that exists. But here, acts of God are used where counter performance uh, is uh, meaningless, not really performance of the contract uh, or, or um, continue of making the contract very expensive to perform as in a uh, or improbable to perform as in a force majeure. Um, MAC exceptions of international calamity. Um, this is, is becoming, uh, th this is something that has come about more after COVID, uh, may have existed earlier, but now the whole concept of pandemics has taken a new role, new um, definition uh, almost. Uh, changes in laws or regulations, changes in interpretation of laws, very important because it's not just a change in law, but how courts look at those changes. Now let's see some concepts of today, what we are seeing today in terms of MAC clauses drafting. Um, the first concept that you will remember is the whole reasonable reasonability concept. The whole concept which says that this is really, a, how would a reasonable person who has all the background knowledge um, that is available to the parties. Um, and uh, he is told to be in that situation. And with that available in information, go into the minds of the parties and say what they were thinking. And with keeping in mind the circumstances, then would what conclusion would that person come to and that's the whole concept that has been written here. And if there are two sort of interpretations that come, courts will take the interpretation that will uh, will be will continue the contract or which will not end or terminate the contract. They would like um, uh, um, consistency. They would like definite. Um, uh, you know, the probability of the contract actually reaching fruition to be there. They don't want to frustrate the contract. So they will choose the definition or the interpretation um, that is more, that is consistent with business common sense and reject the other one. So um, it's, it's would reasonably be expected to is more, it's probably a pro buyer term, more future sort of reflective of what, what's going to happen in the future. Um, it's it sort of um, 
for example, I used that example earlier, you lose a customer, main customer, nothing has happened today. You just lost a customer. Your business has not suffered any consequences of that. You're still earning the same revenue. You know, nothing dramatic has happened, but potentially, would you reasonably expect that the business is going to suffer tomorrow because you've lost a huge customer today and you may not be able to get a similar customer. So that's a concept that you will find. You won't, you will find the subjectivity creeping in. Subjectivity oftentimes in this manner of drafting is pro buyer and you will find this subjectivity in a lot of clauses that you draft. So when you are drafting your clauses, think about this, think how objective you want to be, or would you like to insert some subjectivity? Um, again, the ex limit limitations of exclusions with the disproportionate effect concept is there, which just says, is the target an outlier or is keeping up with the peers and its industry? So this is a very important concept of limitation to the exclusions. You will find this coming up very much in drafting today. Now we move on to another very important concept and that this concept is of materiality. And I'll hand over to Siddharth as he talks about materiality, which is the M of a Mac in any case. Thank you, Sajan. So, when it comes to materiality, the question is how, if a MAC clause were to be before a court of law, how will it be interpreted? Now, when we talk of interpretation, the most fundamental rule of contract law is that a contract must be observed. Courts do not generally like parties walking out, their, out of their deals buyers walking out of their deals on mere technicalities, etc. But over time, common law has developed several exceptions to this strict rule and impracticability and frustration are the exception. From the standpoint of India, MAC clauses will be interpreted in accordance with the usual principles of contractual interpretation relying on the Indian Contract Act of 1872. And the key issue will always be what a material adverse change is. However, a material adverse change is rarely defined in the agreement with any great specificity. And its interpretation is typically subject to uncertainty. Since parties tend to use broad language in the MAC clause, it will eventually be up to the court to assess what is a MAC within the context of the particular set of facts. And before I throw light on the screen, that the, the slide that you see, courts, not in India, but UK, Delaware, they have called out certain principles of interpretation so far as MAC clauses are concerned. And if I could just list out few of those for everyone's understanding. Number one, if a party is trying to show that there has been a MAC in a company's financial condition, this should be determined primarily by reference to a company's financial information covering the relevant period. Although the inquiry can extend beyond the financial information to include other evidence if it is compelling. Two, an adverse change must be material and will only be material if it is significantly affecting a company's ability to perform its obligations. See, an adverse change must not be merely temporary. Four, a party cannot trigger an event of default based on circumstances of which it was aware at the outset. And five, it is for the party alleging a MAC to prove that a MAC has occurred. Now, taking a cue from these guidance notes from various UK courts, what is discernible is that every adverse change does not amount to a MAC. In other words, 
only material changes do then if the math clause prescribes a formula or method for what is material then the issue of materiality will depend on the said formula or method and in a situation where no formula or method is prescribed then it will be for the court to determine whether the change in question is material based on judicially formulated principles the five principles that i set out for you now there have been judgments from courts in delaware which have evolved various principles to determine materiality in mac clauses and this is specifically in the context of acquisition agreements and it will be helpful if i set out these principles for you it has been held on various occasions that contractual language has to be read in the larger context of the transaction to determine what is material then notion of a materially adverse event is imprecise and varies depending on the context of the agreement and its parties as well as the words chosen by the parties even where a mac condition is broadly worded the same is best read as a backstop protecting the buyer from the occurrence of unknown events that substantially threaten the overall earning potential of the target in a durationally significant manner it is very important to note that a short short term hiccup in earnings is not sufficient rather the match should be material when viewed from a long term perspective of a reasonable buyer and who is a reasonable buyer as sadhi explained someone who is aware of all the background information now the most important consideration is whether there has been an adverse change in the target's business that is consequential to the target's long term earning power over a commercially reasonable period which one would expect to be measured in years rather than months and this also in a way overlaps with the point i made earlier that a short term hiccup will not be sufficient and the issue of whether a change or effect constitutes a mac has both qualitative aspects and quantitative aspects when we look at it from the standpoint of financing agreements regarding what constitutes a material change and the new south wales supreme court has held that a sufficiently significant failure to meet budget expectations would constitute a material adverse change in this case the court also observed that the principles of reasonableness and good faith must be followed by the lender while formulating an opinion that there were grounds to believe a material and adverse change had occurred so these are so far these are some of the principles which courts have laid down guidance notes i would say to interpret mac clauses and to a certain if an event or a change is material enough to to be called a trigger event over to you sir so now we come to a very important uh, discussion or very important concept all the mac clauses we've shown you um uh, you know some of them are most of them are different uh, have been written for highlighting some points but you will find ambiguity uh prevalent in the uh, document in the drafting and the the samples that we we'll give you for um editing uh will also have ambiguity and uh, you have the choice of not making them unambiguous very objective so is ambiguity intentional if it is intentional then the whole issue is why ambiguity because why are you creating more difficulties for people why do you have why you know it's it's a burden it's a hurdle in the transaction why would you have such ambiguous clauses uh, you know what's really the purpose of the clause so is it more detrimental to have a mac than to not have a mac or to have a very clear like a force majeure a very very clear objective clause well if you had a very clear objective clause then the chances of um 
you know, meeting thresholds of things becoming very clear and the, the transaction ending or not ending would be very open. The Mac, as we've mentioned earlier, and we will end with it, is really, is often used as a renegotiation tool. And to be able to do that, you have to have ambiguity because you have to allow people to discuss things. They can't know everything in the beginning. Everything can't be written in the contract. There must be a chance that people can say, okay, this has happened. Let's look at it another way. Let's see what we can do. Maybe we can adjust the price. Maybe we can adjust some conditions. Maybe we can delay some things. All of these terms allow deal certainty. An ambiguity, therefore, in this particular context where the deal can end, ambiguity helps in certainty of the deal by allowing parties a greater scope for negotiation. So a strict construct versus an ambiguous statement um, is what we are talking about here. And the ambiguous statement here strangely gives the, uh, the deal certainty and therefore is something that parties choose and will hopefully it is there and hopefully will continue. Well, having said all of that, we do still have the issue of having a mag, having a dispute, and then we go to the court to enforce the MAC. So Siddharth, what are these enforcement hurdles that we need to grapple with? So Sajan, and since there is ambiguity, matters go to court and courts then grapple with how to ascertain meaning and how to ascertain the intentions of the parties. So the biggest problem with enforcing a MAC clause is proving that an adverse event or condition calls for changes to put an end to the transaction. And Indian courts are generally reluctant to grant buyers the right to back out of a deal because of a MAC, even though there's limited case law. But even when you put in the concepts of, read the concepts of frustration, force measure, etc., the trend is that courts are reluctant to grant the buyers the right to walk out. Even in Delaware, where many of America's largest corporations are registered. Courts have never really granted a MAC lawsuit. During the Great Recession, also when the target companies' bottom lines kept falling, courts still held buyers responsible to complete the deal. So a buyer who wants out of an MA because of a MAC assumes the burden of proof. So there is a heavy burden, heavy onus put on the party alleging that a MAC event has occurred. And that's the biggest hurdle that is faced. Let me give you an example now. The Federal Court of Australia in one case, while examining whether change in cash flow projections of the acquiring company would result into a material adverse change, held that the onus of establishing existence of the same and that it actually constituted a change of the requisite kind lies on the lender. The federal court further held that change in cash flow projections cannot be treated as a material adverse change. So to substantiate a claim under a MAC clause, the adverse event or condition must be one that will last for years and not just months. It must be long term, said differently. The triggering event condition or discovery must have been unforeseeable at the time the deal was signed. And these two factors represent a high legal hurdle. Now, at this stage, maybe I would also want to highlight few other principles of interpretation, which Justice Blair of the England and Wales High Court has laid down in a landmark case titled Grupo Hotel Row on how interpretation of math clauses goes. And this may also throw some light on the hurdles then. So it's held in this case that well settled rules as to interpretation of contracts must be applied, giving effect to what the parties have stipulated in their agreement. 
the assessment of borrower's financial condition should normally begin with an examination of its financial information at the relevant times and a lender seeking to show a map should do so by reference to that information the ability of the company to fund future prospective liabilities must not be a criteria for interpretation unless the adverse change in its financial condition significantly affects the borrower's ability to perform its obligations and in particular its ability to repay the loan it is not a material change as we've indicated before the material change must not be temporary so if a lender was aware of the affairs affairs of the company at the time of signing the agreement then in that case mac cannot be invoked and again burden of proof lies on the lender now sir at this stage maybe we could throw some light on the two leading cases which all those who joined us would have read about and the most significant global case involving an allegation that a material adverse change had had occurred is the deliver chancery lawsuit brought last year by twitter against Elon Musk to specifically enforce the acquisition agreement which Musk wanted to terminate. Now, in his response to this complaint or lawsuit, Elon Musk put a counter claim, and amongst other things, he tried to justify the termination. on the ground that twitter had made material misrepresentations in the acquisition agreement that resulted in a material adverse event triggering the mac clause in the agreement after weeks of legal maneuvering by both parties and intense public and media scrutiny musk reversed course and agreed to move forward with the transaction which was completed sometime in october last year but prior to the resolution of this case and i'm sure everyone who's joining us would have also read about it there was significant speculation that musk was going to face an uphill battle in pursuing his counter claims as a result of what was described as a relatively low level of due diligence undertaken prior to the execution of the acquisition agreement potential liability for resolution of the case if the court court ruled against musk and rulings in the case against trial delays sought by musk and denying limited certain discovery requ requests by musk to support his misrepresentation counter claims the second case which may be of some interest and which highlights so how... here before you go on the second case i would just add uh, to the audience that it is very important that no one wins in these cases in mac cases and therefore you have very little or very few mac cases the courts don't want to opine obviously but the parties also don't want a decision because a decision is detrimental to all concerned so if the decision is in favor of the buyer which means the buyer can exit then you are publicly accepting that the seller has lost value which will affect the the share price and the overall business attractiveness of the buyer or the target if the seller wins then the buyer has to acquire someone that they have already said is very low value and they don't want it so no one wins if anybody wins it is something then therefore courts the business certainty is what courts work towards and therefore they don't want to opine they put such a high threshold and therefore there's very little mac case law jurisprudence globally so and that was what happened with elon musk he withdrew everything but and it was good he realized that there there would, would be no winner in that situation over to the other very interesting case yes sir thank you and uh, this case in fact shows how a mag clause eventually results in a renegotiation so this is the case of 
Tiffany and LV. Now Tiffany brought an action against LV sometime in September 2020. Again, before the Delaware Chancery Court to enforce the $16.2 billion merger agreement from which LV sought to walk away due to concerns arising out of the pandemic. In addition to claiming that it was entitled to walk away from the deal on account of pandemic related math, LV had asserted that Tiffany had breached a pre closing covenant to operate in the ordinary course of business by declaring a significant dividend while facing the pandemic induced decline in its retail results. The litigation was resolved eventually through a settlement under which LV received several million dollars purchase price reduction. So this is among several deals in which MAC clauses have played a role in MNA litigation arising out of the pandemic and its fallout. These cases highlight the leverage afforded to buyers when they can invoke a MAC clause as a basis to terminate or to renegotiate an MNA deal. Over to you, sir. So this is time that we moved to India from Delaware. We've spent a lot of time in Delaware, but we felt these two cases, of course, got a lot of press and most of you have read them more than any Indian case. Um, but also they highlight some very important concepts of MAC that we wanted to highlight, uh, not in terms of uh, drafting, but more in terms of the concept of the MAC. So let's just move to India and try and understand where does materiality come in our laws and you know the law that or, or the regulator that we could look at was sebi so over to pulkit our sebi expert thank you sajay thank you Sadat. i hope uh, everyone is enjoying this session uh, so the phrase material adverse change or material adverse event does not find any mention in any securities law as uh, has been discussed earlier, it is a clause which allows parties to walk away from a transaction pursuant to occurrence of certain events which have significantly affected the business of the target company. Under the provisions of the SEBI takeover regulations, there are various thresholds which have been prescribed under which open offer obligations are triggered. However, there are only limited circumstances under which a party can withdraw an open offer. Now, before we analyze these conditions, Let's let's try to see how SEBI uh, uh, interprets the term material. So in securities laws, the term material has been repeatedly used in the listing regulations. That's listing obligation and disclosure requirements regulations, which are applicable to every listed entity. Regulation 16.1c defines material subsidiaries to mean a subsidiary whose income or net worth exceeds 10% of consolidated income or net worth of the listed entity and its subsidiaries. Regulation 23 deals with related party transactions and regulation 23 one states that uh, a related party transaction would be material if individually or taken together with other transactions in a given year exceeds 1000 crore or 10% of annual consolidated revenue of the listed entity as per the last audited financial statements. Now, now this percentage of 10% has been reduced to 5% in case the transaction relates to brand, brand usage or royalty and this comes under regulation 23.1a, which has been recently introduced last month. Now regulation 23.2 states that all related party transactions and subsequent material modifications require prior approval of the audit committee. Now every committee, every company is required to every listed company. Every listed company is required to have a policy to determine what constitutes material modifications. Oftentimes it means variation of 20 to 25% or approximately rupees 10 crore or so, whichever is lesser. Regulation 30 of the listing regulation uh, requires listed entities to make to disclose events which are considered to be material by the board of the entity. Subregulation 4 prescribes the criteria for determining materiality. In terms of regulation 30, we have uh, recently SEBI has amended the listed regulations and there has been an introduction of sub, uh, sub clause C where they have uh, linked where they have said that material events would mean event whose value or impact exceeds the lower of 2% of the turnover, 2% of the net worth or 5% of abs average absolute value of profit or loss as per the last three financial statements. So from all these instances, we can see the term material has different meanings in the context in which it is used. 
SEBI has tried to keep the interpretation of material objective by linking it to various parameters. So the word material actually cannot have a straight jacket meaning and will have to be interpreted based on the context and the situation. One can take guidance from these parameters, but what is material? You'll have to see on a case to case basis. Coming back to takeovers and situations under which an acquirer can bring out an open uh, can back out of an open offer. The conditions are extremely stringent. Regulation 23 of the takeover regulation permits withdrawal of open offer under 4 conditions. The 1st condition is refusal of statutory approvals. The 2nd condition is then death of uh, sole acquirer. 3rd 1 is failure to fulfill certain conditions in the agreement, which are beyond reasonable control of the acquirer. And the 4th 1 is circumstances convincing SEBI that withdrawal can be made. Now, the 3rd condition has been introduced in uh, 2000 in the takeover regulations 2011. Prior to that, there were takeover uh, regulations 1997 in force, which did not have this condition. Now, in different judgments, Supreme Court has held that the only condition or the situation in which an open offer can be withdrawn is if the situation is in the realm of impossibility and the offer cannot be performed altogether. This was first held in the case of Nirma Industries and another versus SEBI in 2013. This was, of course, in the context of the 1997 regulations. Nirma sought to argue that the target company had failed to disclose poor financial performance, and hence Nirma should be permitted to withdraw the offer. The Supreme Court held that the first two conditions, that is refusal of statutory approval and death of a sole acquirer, belong to the genus of legal impossibility. And therefore, by applying the principle of S. Jordan Generis, held that under the third circumstance, that is the circumstances that merit withdrawal in the opinion of SEBI, the third circumstance would also have to be interpreted in such a way that the circumstance makes it impossible to proceed with the offer. Therefore, Nirma's case was completely rejected. Subsequently, in 2014, in the case of Akshaya infrastructure, the Supreme Court was faced with the question that if an offer voluntarily made through a public announcement for purchase of shares in the target company can be permitted to be withdrawn at a time when the voluntary offer has become uneconomical to be performed. Answering the same in the negative, the court applied the narrow interpretation and stated that economic difficulty to conclude an offer did not amount to an exception under Regulation 27.1. Hence, the offerer was not permitted to leave the takeover. This was followed by the case of Pramod Jain in 2016, where Supreme Court once again held that inordinate delay in SEBI approving the offer and the company becoming a sick company, the target in becoming a sick company, cannot amount to the offer becoming impossible to perform. Pursuant to Pramod Jain, there have not been any uh, significant judgments related to withdrawal of open offer. In 2011, once the new takeover code came into play, SEBI added the condition for under 23.1c that an offer made may be withdrawn if the condition mentioned in the acquisition agreement, which triggers the offer obligation is not satisfied for reasons beyond the control of the acquirer. However, this condition is yet to be tested in courts. In 2016, while interpreting provisions of Regulation 23 in the matter of Jyoti Laboratories Private Limited, the whole time member of SEBI relied upon the decisions of the Supreme Court uh, and held that withdrawal can only be permitted if the offer becomes impossible to perform. Therefore, it would be reasonable to assume that in a given case involving interpretation of clause C, the reasons must qualify the threshold of impossibility. So to sum it up, in a nutshell, once an offer has been made, once an open offer has been made, it can only be withdrawn if the obligation becomes impossible to perform. Handing it back to Sajay. So I think now you have a fairly decent idea you have a fairly decent idea of the um, what a Mac is, and um, we would now want you to craft a Mac from some samples. We we've sort of put something together which may be incomplete, which may be inappropriate, which may be lacking, or which could be made better. So. Um, if you can have a look at this and um, look at what we have sent you, we've sent it to you online. So you have a, you, you can click on that and we've also sent it to your email. Um, so it's in the chat box. If you look at the chat box and click on that and also check your emails, you'll get some samples. We, you'll get four. 
Uh, we'll give you a few minutes to look at them, maybe work on them, and then you can submit what you worked on one by one all together. Um, so somebody is saying, uh, Pulkit, can you just check? Somebody's chatting, unable to access link. So can you ask Pavan to just? Um, so we'll we'll um, try and see what's wrong. But in the meantime, will you check your email? We've also emailed the exercises to all of you. We we do have three. We had we do have four. I think here the. PPT just talks about three, but I think we have four for you. Um, so uh, you can have a look at those and try and work on those. Remember all the concepts we told you about. Um, so the link seems to be working. Okay. Thanks, Surendra. So, uh, so long as you've got it, that's great. Though the link seems to be working. We just did a test and the link did work. Um, so please. Uh, work on the text. We'll give you a few minutes and then we'll share at least three of them. Again, nothing is perfect. Nothing is a standard clause and you can draft them as you desire. As you're drafting, just some drafting concepts for you. Typically, common law has a default provision wherein something that you haven't uh, catered for, you can always fall back on a common law concept um, and you would probably get recourse there. Um, when there is a very high stake in a transaction, people draft a clause to cover that particular situation in a contract and negotiate that heavily. There's a lot of time, effort, and money that goes into it. And that eventually becomes a customized clause or a contract. If you don't have enough time, money, and effort that you can put in, or it's a low value transaction, you usually rely on the default position existing under common law. Between these two extreme positions is what we call standard form contracts or standard, standard form drafts or standard clauses that exist. Um, so one extreme is where the contract is silent. You go um, with the, the common law will fill the gap. Um, you know, you can't really afford lawyers. You can't have somebody draft that in. When you when the stakes are high, you draft something very, very specific and you have a customized contract between these two positions are the standard clauses. Standard clauses as they have emerged. Um, standard clauses obviously come from uh, highly draft, uh, negotiated clauses, which over a period of time become standard. These are liquidated damages, arbitration, force majeure. All of these you will find in um, commercial form agreements. So what we are, MAC has yet to become very standard. That's why we have so many samples, but it's closing in over there. So now it's time. Let's see what we had given you and what we really wanted. Whatever happened to the draft? Okay, so they didn't come through. Yeah, you, you have that. So you had um, the completion. Did, do you want to make it big over there? Or I think that it's full size. Okay, so this is um, completion of the Completion of the agreement is conditional, but uh, Pulke, do you want to do this? Because mm -hmm. you had, so you have the draft, which is not. So completion of this agreement is conditional on the investor jointly completing due diligence. Restoration of the company. Now what we had sent to them. 
the clause will be shared with the audience provider that the investigation of the time for consummation of the transaction. Now, this is something which brings in an element of vagueness, and it cannot be at any time. It must be at the sign of time of signing. So these words should ideally be deleted, and therefore, what you see on the screen. These words are not there at any time, at any point of time before consummation of transaction, which was there in your version. So this you should strike out. And then it reads further and that investigation not revealing any fact or matter that would have a material adverse effect on the company. Material adverse effect means any event, condition or change. Now what the clause on the screen says is not what you had. What you had provided, including but not limited to mere economic unviability, ability to fund future prospective liabilities, acts of God, changes due to acts of war, terrorism, political conditions, and so on. Now, these are all exceptions, MAC exceptions, as we explained. So you need to strike this out. And therefore, what you see on the screen, these exceptions are now not there in the sample that you see. Moving on to the next one. Now here, it's broadly okay, but I'm not sure many of you were able to look at the glaring errors in this. So in the first two lines, MAC event means an event, occurrence, fact, condition, development, omission, or effect occurring after the execution date, but any time prior to last chance completion. Now, this is something which is vague. So, a correct clause should ideally not have this, but any time prior to the last chance completion, because this is a vague timeline. Then, if you look at clause A, has or with the passage of time or any other factor could reasonably be expected to have a material adverse effect on the business, financial condition, operations, assets, or liabilities or cash flow projections or future prospective liabilities. Now, cash flow projection is not a max event based on the case law that we discussed. So, this shouldn't be there. And then B, directionally impairs. Now, we discussed the concept of materially. So, it can't be fractionally. Fractionally is the opposite of materially. So, it should be materially impairs. And in the next line also, materially impairs the ability of any of the parties. And similarly, you see the expression fractionally is incorrect. It should be materially. Now, moving on to the third one. Now, this was more of a fill in the blanks for you. We discussed the concept of reasonably <coughs> and what a reasonable man will look at, a reason, reasonable prudent man. And therefore, the blanks that you see should have the expression purchaser being reasonably satisfied following a reasonable review. So I hope these three you've been able to assess and see and analyze what additions or subtractions could have been made to make them better and more compliant with the concepts that we discussed today. You could discuss sample clause four also. From the date of this agreement, there should not have occurred any event, any fact, matter, event, circumstance, condition, or change which materially. So, here, though, in the first line, uh, the clause that you have received, the words fact, matter, event, circumstance, condition, or change uh, have been omitted. So, the, the clause should be such that it covers most of the events so that you can reasonably take a stand that there is a material adverse event. Then coming to the next line, <coughs> which materially and adversely affects or could reasonably be expected to materially and adversely affect individually or in aggregate the business, operations, assets, liabilities, conditions, whether financial, trading, or otherwise, prospects or results of the company and its subsidiaries. So a lot of it has been trimmed down, which would make the clause extremely vague. Coming to the next part, but excluding any of the foregoing arising out of resulting from or attributable to 
changes in stock markets, interest rates, exchange rates, commodity prices, or general economic conditions. Now, general economic conditions is again something which adds vagueness to this clause, and it's not something that can be uh, easily taken to court. Starting from point B, changes in conditions generally having a wide impact on the entire industry in which the uh, company operates. So, in the clause that you have, the company and its subsidiaries is included, but here only the company uh, in the clause that has been shared, only the company has been referred to. Again, the scope of the clause is then limited. So, these are the changes which would uh, sort of make it uh, difficult to uh, press this clause in court and test this out. So, with that, um, do we move to the uh, yeah? So. Basically, um, with those samples, I'm, I'm not sure if you got a chance to um, review those samples. The the samples that you uh, that were shared with you um, were, if you all got a chance to review them, that's great. If you didn't get a chance to review them, no problem. Uh, take your time, just go through them. There is no, um, there is no particular uh, format that is right or wrong. There is every concept that we've spoken about, about can be used in a manner uh, that suits the circumstances. Um, and therefore we would you know, encourage you to look at each one of those clause with several ways of redrafting them. But as we come to the end of our session, I think um, all that we have discussed brings us uh, to a point where we want to reiterate the concept of or the use of Mac um, but, and the most important use of uh, a Mac clause is to restructure the deal. Um, if there was as much jurisprudence, as much clarity in the drafting, as much jurisprudence on the subject, um, the renegotiation option may not have existed um, as uh, pr as as uh, um, as a viable option, um, which it does today because of uh, I would say the ambiguity in drafting, the lack of jurisprudence on the subject. So please look at the MAC um, as a renegotiation tool while you're drafting. And when you read it in a clause, also do consider it as a renegotiation tool to help not just the buyer, but it could help both parties. So it, it, it is a very important tool. Um, it often is perceived as a buyer's way of, um, you know, exit or, um, you know, negotiating the price down, but it doesn't actually always have to be that it could be some terms that could be changed to the benefit of the parties or the situation. So look at it that way. And with that, we, as we close, we bring some practical tips when you're drafting. Um, whenever you, the first point of the practical tips is be practical, which uh, is, is, is very uh, relevant. You specify the events as much as you can. Um, be specific um, to, uh, you know, circumstances, situations, causes, effects that you are looking at. Um, again, you could have ambiguity if you want, but the point that you need to look at is how specific you want to be or not. The second is to measure how objective the criteria will be 10% reduction, 100% reduction, what level of change is acceptable? How objective do you want? Uh, the subjective standards that we mentioned in the opinion, in the um, value, uh, in, in, in the view, in the assessment of somebody, a party or both parties, that's the subjectivity that is there. Again, you have to decide whether to use it or not to use it. Time frames, how forward looking will it be? Time frames could rel be relevant to uh, during which time uh, something happened. Uh, when you reiterate uh, um, a clause 
or when you reiterate uh, uh, um, a confirmation, um, uh, a warranty, um, uh, and also, as I said, how forward looking would you want it to be? All of these are relevant for the time frame. Uh, looking ahead is the forward looking uh, bit. Um, how how um, would general economic conditions and market conditions uh, be exceptions? Uh, will they not be exceptions? Um, how would you um, look at um, the uh, um, disproportionate effect on the target? Um, could there be other get out clauses, a, a carefully drafted termination uh, clause? Um, uh, a, a clause which is a covenant which says that the parties need to perform something or there is an obligation on a party to perform. Um, could you look at something else where in the agreement as a get out clause as against a MAC? Uh, if you can articulate something practically, objectively, uh, without subjectivity, then probably you know, just put it somewhere else. If you do, like we mentioned about um, Elon Musk, when he realized that probably he didn't really do a good diligence on Twitter, he would have known some things if he had done a better diligence, and therefore he probably withdrew. Um, um, he withdrew because he could have had a wrongful termination suit against him. So, to avoid a wrongful termination suit again, um, you have to be careful that you use MAC carefully and not um, in a manner that could result in uh, parties claiming that you have abused the system, you have abused the clause. Um, finally, as uh, just mentioned, it is a renegotiation option, very valuable. The ambiguity, the lack of case law jurisprudence helps that process. And therefore, remember that um, when you have, um, when you're drafting a MAC clause. Um, and again, it's not always that the price has to be uh, reversed or downward negotiation. It could be um, uh, some terms that get changed. Um, oh. These clauses are all here. Sorry, they came a little later in my presentation. Um, with that, um, I think we are done um, with um, the uh, presentation. I would say just to conclude, just to be sure um, that you've understood, um, MAC clauses are becoming more standard in Indian transactions. Uh, in the clauses that we've seen in recent past, many of them reflect global uncertainty, global security concerns, health, the pandemic obviously has pushed that, geopolitical risks, trade tensions. Um, again, um, uh, you know, it could have been the war or it could have been China, but trade tensions are there. Changing regulations, government enforcement regarding competition, and foreign investment, um, which many countries, the US, UK, many countries, Italy, Germany, Spain, are all looking more into, like we, ha we have uh, our foreign investment regulations we've had for a bit, um, are looking at foreign investment and actually, at, so, so to say, approving or disapproving foreign investment, especially in very critical, services and critical industries. Maybe it's directed towards China, maybe not. Maybe it's directed towards Russia, maybe not. But there is a increased um, scrutiny of foreign investment coming into different jurisdictions. Um, but at the end of the day, MAC clauses allocate risk between the parties, reflect the leverage that a party has based on economic and other uh, conditions or just market conditions. Um, so that's what we had to say, what we had to um, share with you. I think we have exceeded our timeline, but if there's a question or two, happy to answer it. 
Uh, otherwise, you have our email IDs and you can always email us and we will be happy to answer questions via email. So with that, uh, can we see any questions popping up? I would say um, uh, I, I just allow Siddharth and Pulkit to give their final comments and say thank you. Um, but uh, from my side, thank you very much for a patient audience. Thank you for participating. We had a very good uh, participation in terms of numbers and very happy with that. Um, and hopefully we'll remain in touch and continue to interact on this and other issues. So with that, thank you and over to Siddharth and Pulkit. Thank you, Sajay, and thank you everyone who's joined us today for a very patient hearing. My concluding thought would be something which I also highlighted at the outset. That the purpose of today's session is to go to, 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 to demonstrate that traditional interpretation of math clauses is not predictable. Courts are reluctant to interfere or permit a contract to be broken based only on a MAC. And one cannot assume that a MAC provision is a substitute for a carefully drafted, specifically tailored representation of warranty or a closing condition, which addresses specific risks and contingencies of the acquired business that have been identified by the buyer. Focus. We'd just like to thank everyone. Uh, Thank you to the audience sitting there. If you have any questions, please, please.